Okay, good morning, church. Is there anybody here that is blessed by the Lord? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let God's people say amen. Open your Bibles to the book of Psalms. We're going to be looking at chapter 3 today. We've been <clears throat> looking at, excuse me, some of these Psalms here and connecting them with the context that they were written in. And the Hebrew word for psalm is mizmor, and mizmor literally means a poem that is to be sung to musical accompaniment. This is something that happened in the temple, this is something that happened at the tabernacle, and what do we call a poem to be sung with musical accompaniment? What do we call that? A psalm. And that's what psalms are. They're songs, songs that were written in a context, songs that were written by a people at a specific time. And we're looking at this book. It has the most chapters of any book in the Bible. And it's such an important book because this book was the hymnal for the nation of Israel. This book was the, the place that they wrote the songs. They placed them and they would sing them at strategic times, at national events, at times to remind them Selves of God's faithfulness over time. These were deeply personal and emotional songs that came from the soul of a people to their creator. And they would sing to God. And this, when you look in the book of Psalms, there is a psalm for almost every emotion you will ever deal with. When you are struggling with an emotion, there is a psalm about that emotion. Today we're talking about having peace under pressure, and we know, we know that the scripture says that we will have a peace that passes all understanding, that God's peace will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. How many believe that? And yet, has anybody here felt some stress this week? You felt any anxiety this week? And see, what the Psalms do, the Psalms take us to another level. They, they help us to deal with these emotions. And they, these songs memorialized events from the past. These are songs that when you, maybe you have a song, that when you hear it, it takes you back to a certain place in time. You can remember something. You even feel great emotion when you hear a certain song. And that's what the Psalms were. They were an instruction to the people. They were something that reminded them of a great event. But these Psalms were not just historic. They didn't just point to how the Hebrew people of the past would worship God. They're not just historic. They are descriptive. They are prescriptive. They tell us how we are to worship the Lord. Does anybody here want to be a better worshiper of the Lord? Do you think we as a people could learn anything from someone like King David about worshiping the Lord? Yeah, absolutely. The Psalms were descriptive. They, they inform us. And so when we read something in Psalm, it's telling us how we should respond. How important was this book of Psalms? In the New Testament, the Psalms were quoted more than any other book in the Bible. Over 200, 216 times they were quoted, uh, there was a quote of the Old Testament, and 119 of those quotes were right out of the book of Psalms. Jesus oftentimes would pray the Psalms. We have that recorded in the scripture. We read that when the disciples on, after the last supper, when they came out of the upper room and were going to the garden of Gethsemane, it said, and they sang Psalms. The biggest events that ever happened, the night that our Lord, before he was crucified, the Psalms were there. They were important to them. How many of you think they should be important to us? Amen. Yeah, Absolutely. See, what happens is, in the, in, in the New Testament, you'll read about something about Jesus. See, they're, they're not only, the Psalms aren't just descriptive. They're not just instruction. They reveal to us more, a more intimate view of Jesus. We understand Jesus in, in, a, in a different way. When the New Testament says that Jesus went to the mountain to pray, the Psalms will tell us what he prayed. How many would like to know what, how Jesus prayed, Amen. When the, when the New Testament tells us that Jesus hung on the cross, the Psalms tell us what Jesus was thinking while he was on the cross. Do you feel the difference in that? 
When we, when we read in the New Testament how Jesus ascended into heaven, the Psalms tell us what took place when he ascended into heaven. It is a whole different level of revelation, of intimacy, where we get a glimpse of God in a new way. And that's why the Psalms are so important. And today, we're looking at Psalm chapter three. We're looking at this place, this story, historic story of King David. And Psalm three is a first in many ways because it's the first psalm that has, that used a selah. And I know you people know what a selah is, right? It's the first psalm with a superscription at the head of it that tells us when it happened. It's the first psalm of 73 psalms that were written by King David that we know for sure. This is the very first one. I want you to turn. What we're going to do is we're gonna read through this first and then we're gonna talk about the context and then we're gonna come back to it. Because oftentimes we disconnect what it says with what it, what it means, what the actual sentiment was. And there's so much there that we, we read right over. Read with me now as we read in Psalm chapter three. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him and God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept, I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O oh Lord, save me, O oh my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone, you have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people, Selah. Let's pray over this word. So Heavenly Father, now we've read your word and God, we're asking that you would allow it to dwell in us richly. That these wouldn't just be words on a page it be the living word of God in our life. That we would have an emotional connection with this God. And Lord, we pray you would activate this and you would bring this to life in Jesus' name. And everybody say it. Amen. Amen. So let's unpack this just for a few moments. When you look at the superscription at the top, look on your Bible there. It says, it says a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. And while many of these superscriptions were, they were not in the original text, they were there, they were there even at the time of Jesus. They were in the, the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible. And so when you look at these superscriptions, what you realize is it's a clear instruction of the time. And this is one of those Psalms. We know exactly when it took place. This Psalm took place at the time of the rebellion of Absalom, David's son. This was a time in the kingdom where, where things were just crazy. David was the greatest king of Israel. We know that. And this context is so important to understanding the this, this psalm. He was the greatest king of Israel, but yet he went from crisis to crisis. And the greatest crisis that he ever faced was on that dark day of his life when David realized a rebellion was going on, that he was going to be deposed, that he would no longer be the king, that he was gonna be cast out of the kingdom. And the worst part was that this civil war was being led by his son, and this is something that started while well, you read about, the, about this, this event in 2 Samuel chapter 15 through 18. It's really back in chapter 11 where the whole thing starts. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, David was at the peak of his power. Everything was going great. The kingdom was wealthy. They were conquering nations and David was almost a little bored. And that is when he made the fatal mistake of not going to war with his armies. He stayed home. And it says that in a moment, a moment of passion, he saw Bathsheba and he acted on a physical impulse and he had an affair with a woman, an illicit affair. And to make matters worse, to cover it up, he had her husband killed. 
And as this was all covered up, he thought it was all good. No one's ever gonna know. My sin's not impacting anybody else. The prophet Nathan comes to him and says, Nathan said, David, you are the man who has sinned. And David immediately repented. And while he was forgiven, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11, Nathan said these words to him. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. It was in this moment, because of David's sin, the prophecy was made by the prophet Nathan. David, there's gonna be adversity coming from your own home. And what a home it was. David had many wives, many wives. You have one wife, you have a good thing. You have many wives. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. Yeah, yeah. You ever heard that? Less is more. You ever hear you can have too much of a good thing? And so David had all these different wives. What a great idea. You know, it's like that fifth bowl of ice cream after you've had it. And you look at it and you go, at the time that seemed like a good idea, but in retrospect, maybe, maybe less is more. David had all these different wives and all these different kids. And David's first six children were from six different women. And they were all this incredible blended dysfunctional family that is so weird. The seeds of dysfunction were sown into it. And worse than that is these kids all lived in the palace. And they knew the secrets of David and they knew exactly what he had done. Dad has been unfaithful to mom. Dad murdered someone to cover it up. And this planted the seeds of rebellion in his children. And as you read, you go on in chapter 12, you read Nathan's rebuke here. In chapter 13, you read about the oldest son. His name was Amnon. And the oldest son falls in love with his half-sister, Tamar. I want to go on the record as telling you that was a very bad idea, okay? Okay. But just like his father, in a moment of lust, he acts on this and he rapes his half-sister, Tamar. And Tamar's full brother, Absalom, brings Tamar into his home. And it says she lived as a desolate woman there from that day forward. Two years pass, and King David, with this horrible incident that happened in his family, where the, the son, his son, raped his daughter, King David did nothing and all of Israel knew about this. Our king allowed this in his own home. And Absalom was the full brother of Tamar. He loved her so much, he ended up naming his, his daughter after her. He would not have it, and he began planning the revenge. One day, the situation was just right, and Absalom murdered his brother Amnon. And immediately he had to flee. He took off. But Absalom's reputation in Israel soared because it was viewed as vigilante justice when the courts would not convict somebody who was guilty, when the king would do nothing, when the king would sit idly by. Absalom was the fighter for justice. He was a, a justice fighter. And he stepped in, and though he was exiled now for multiple years, his reputation in Israel was that that guy does what's right. When you look in chapter, 13, chapter 14, you read about David restoring Absalom and allowing him to come home again. But then in chapter 15 begins the seeds of Absalom's rebellion. And it says that Absalom, when he came back home, he would go to the city gate every day. And he'd stand by the city gate and he would listen to people when they came in and they needed to see a judge, they needed to see one about a legal matter. And he'd look him in the eye and he'd say, you know, your case seems right. Your case seems right. But there's no deputy of the king here to hear it. Oh, if, if I were only to be appointed a judge, I could help for there to be justice in the land. And it says that Absalom would stand at the gate and he would see people, and when they recognized him, he would hug them, he'd shake their hand and kiss them on their cheek. And little by little, 
One businessman at a time. One official at a time. One soldier at a time. One chief advisor at a time. What it says is that Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And they were deceived into following him. The Absalom is a justice fighter. Absalom would do things right. David has killed people. David has had affairs. David does not vindicate what is right. He allows all these things to go wrong. And Absalom appears to be this one who is, who is righteous, who will do what is right. And then the morning comes. And Absalom goes to his father and says, King David, would you allow me to go to Hebron, which is quite a ways away, so that I could pay my vow to the Lord? And King David says, yes, you can go. And when Absalom goes, this is the beginning of his plot. He pulls hundreds of soldiers to go with him. They don't even know what's happening, but now they're part of the rebellion. He begins, it says that his group began to grow and grow and the conspiracy grew strong and Absalom sent spies throughout Israel to all 12 tribes and the spies told the people, when you hear the, the trumpet blast, stand up and yell, Absalom reigns from Hebron. And in that moment, the morning of, King David wakes up in his home. He's in his bathrobe. He hasn't had his coffee yet. <laughs> this is before Keurig. This is before Nespresso, okay? He hadn't, had, he hadn't woken up. His hair is probably a mess. He's probably got morning breath. He's looking bad. He's walking around the bare, barefoot in the house and the cord on his bathrobe's dragging onto the ground and his wife's saying, Wait, would you straighten up? And all of a sudden, a messenger comes to King David and says, King David, the hearts of the, peep, the men of Israel are with Absalom. And like a jolt of lightning, King David realizes they're coming for me. And he looks out the window and he realizes that there's going to be, here come the armies and the troops. And just in moments before they arrive, he comes to his senses and he runs through the household. He says, arise, get up, for the sword of Absalom is upon us. And they take off and David runs without even getting dressed. He runs, he's just clothed in his morning gear. And he runs, it says he goes down across the, the brook of Kidron. And he goes through the Kidron Valley and he's coming up the Mount of Olives. And we read this verse in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 30. It says, so David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up. And he had his head covered and went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went up. What well, started out as a peaceful morning in one moment became the worst nightmare of King David's life. And now he's running for his life and he's heading up the Mount of Olives and he's lost. He realizes, I've lost my kingdom. I've lost my family, my wives, and worst of all, I've lost my son, Absalom, whom I love. As he's going up the Mount of Olives, if you'll look with me in chapter three, God puts this song in his heart, verse one. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many of his previous friends forsook him. His key advisors turned against David in this moment. And David is realizing he has more enemies than friends the adrenaline rush that's going through his body, the fear that's going through, the stress, the anxiety. David realizes that these people have come against me. And this is what happens. What David does is David goes from, in one morning, peace in his heart to the most stressful day of his life. Can anybody relate with that? Have you had that happen? And this psalm is prescriptive in the nature that when we lose our peace, how do we recapture that to have peace in an incredibly pressured situation? 
because you're facing situations that sometimes catch you off guard. At a moment, you lose that peace and you say, Lord, you've got to help. What did King David do on the worst day of his life? The first thing we learn from this that we have to do is we have to place our problems on the Lord. You gotta place your problems on the Lord, okay? Now here's what we, have, what we do so often. We take our, take our burden to the Lord and then we, we talk about it and then we take it back with us and we're still carrying that burden. There's a very important part that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to not take it back with us. When we pray about our problems, we place it on the Lord. Lord, the battle belongs to you, amen? We place our problems on the Lord. David describes these two problems that he has. The first one is this, many are they who rise up against me. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. And then secondly, he says this in verse two, many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Now, a lot of times when we come to the Lord, we, we, we think of the New Testament passage that says, uh, you know, uh, you know, not to complain. Philippians chapter two talks, talks about that. Uh, do everything without complaining. How many have heard that verse, yeah? Okay, so here's where we have to understand the difference. The difference is not so much in the action as the direction, okay? It's not about the action, it's about the direction. When I am complaining, when I'm doing, you know what I'm doing? I'm spreading it all around. I'm gonna to complain to you, I'm gonna to complain to you, I'm gonna to complain to you and you and you and you and you, and guess what? All of you combined are gonna be able to do about my problem. <laughs> Can everybody do that with me? <laughs> That's a deep theological term if you've never <laughs> heard of it before. What David learned is, well, my problem, I don't spread it around, I lift it up. I lift it up, I lift my problem up to the one who is able to do something about it. I lift my problem up to the one who has all authority in heaven and earth. I lift my problem to him, and that is not complaining, that is articulating what is going on. This is why the Psalms are so powerful. I take my pain, I take my problem, Whatever I am dealing with, depression, circumstances, and I articulate to that to the Lord as David did when he said, many are they who rise up against me. You gotta articulate to the Lord exactly what it is. And there's a time where it's not enough to be thinking a prayer in our mind. And you think, why would I say this to God? God already knows this. You need to get in alignment with God. And that problem has got a hold of you emotionally where you can't see through. It's like an eclipse of the sun. The teeny tiny moon is blocking out the rays of the massive sun. You gotta get past that eclipse where you get, you see a revelation that your God is bigger than the problem you're dealing with. What do we do? Here's how we respond oftentimes in America. We deny you're riding with your wife in the car. And your wife says, what's wrong? And what do you say? Nothing. And they're like, oh yeah, there's something wrong for sure. Right? The matter of its husband, wife, oh yeah, there's something wrong. I can feel it, okay? There's something wrong in here. No, there's nothing wrong. No, everything's just fine. We press it down, press it down. Just, if I just push this down, it's just gonna go away. If I just don't articulate this, then it's gonna go away. And so we deny that our problem is there. And all the time, you are leading yourself to a massive physical problem because your body keeps count of all those things you press down. Can somebody say amen? amen. And listen, I'm excited about the rapture, but not the rupture. I want you to live a healthy life for Jesus. And when we bring our problems to the Lord and place them on him, that's when we experience the peace that passes understanding. We deny it. 
Here's another thing we do. We deny, and the second thing we do, we let it fly. We let it fly. I will talk to you any way I want. You ever hear that, right? And it's kind of like this, this drink, this delicious carbonated beverage. Now, if I took this and I shook it up, I threw it on the ground. Hi, Terry. <laughs> I'm just shaking this, boom, man, it's good. And then... And it's at moments like this, you realize you have a credibility gap with a congregation, okay? <laughs> if I were to open up the mouth of this delicious carbonated beverage, what would happen? <sighs> It'd get all over Pastor Wendell. <laughs> Never good Terry. Evil Pastor Wendell would get so... If I just open up the mouth of that can, it's going everywhere. It's gonna make a mess. You're gonna have a memory. That was horrible. Oh my goodness. And when you open up your mouth and you just think, I'm just calling it as it is, I want you to know your children are listening to you. Your grandchildren are listening to you. They're taking an assessment of what you say. And when you spread it all around, all you are doing is making a mess. Don't spread it around. What do you do? Lift it up. Try this with me. Don't spread it around. Move your arms. Woo! There's freedom in Jesus, right? Don't spread it around. What do we do? Lift it up. Lift it up. Place your problems on the Lord. And when you do that, there's gonna be a freedom you experience. We do it the wrong way. We complain to others. And what we're supposed to do is honestly go to the Lord in prayer. And David boldly brings these two official complaints to God. And the second one he says here in verse two, many are they who say of me, there is no help for him and God. When we read in 2 Samuel 16, when David got over the top of the hill, there was a man there by the name of Shimei. And Shimei was a descendant. He was a relative of King Saul. He was a Benjamite. And he had held a grudge all this time. And he, he said, bloody man, bloody man, out. The, the, the guilt, the blame of King Saul has fallen upon your household. And God is giving the kingdom to Absalom. And this is more than just a physical conflict. We're talking about mental and spiritual warfare. Because Shimei was accusing him of his character. David, you're not just a bad person. This is brought on from God for the evil that you have done in the past. David, you're going down. God is bringing you down just as he left Saul. And Saul lost the throne. David, you're going down because God has forsaken you. He has turned his back on you. And this is when David realized, he starts thinking, the only one who can deliver me is now against me. God has, has turned against me because of what I've done. And Shimei is throwing rocks at him. David knew he had sinned, but he had prayed as well. What did David do to Shimei? You know what he did? He pulled out his phone and he slammed him on Instagram. <laughs> That'll teach him, right, right? And we started out, warning, this is a rant, right? You're gonna change the world through your thumbs, right? Did David, did David answer Shimei? Did he get into a battle with him? No. What did he do? He takes it to the Lord. He takes it to the Lord. And he prays here in this verse two. And David does two specific things. He identifies two problems. But then we see the other important thing David did after he placed his problem on the Lord. He turned his focus to the Lord. Look in verse three. He says this in the midst of all of this. It looks like everything is going wrong. He's in complete distress, but now he turns his attention from the problem to his Lord. And he says, but you, O oh Lord, 
But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. But you, O Lord, can you say that with me? But you, O Lord, but you, O Lord. Oh, of all the, all the, all the buts, and we've talked about doing a series on the big buts in the Bible, but this would be the but that is the biggest of all. When you are facing your problem, call out and remember, but you, O Lord. Yes, I lost my kingdom. Yes, I'm running for my life, but Lord, you are bigger than any of this. How many of you know your God's bigger than any problem you're facing, amen? And what does he do? David begins, instead of focusing on his problem, now he is turning his attention to the Lord. He stops focusing on the problem. He is more in awe of his, the size, by the size of his God than the size of his problem. He begins directing his praise to him. Things look really bad, God, but you, O oh Lord. And this is where the psalm helps us to change our perspective. And this is where confident, faith-filled prayer refuses to be more focused on the size of our problem than the one that we bring it to. So many times we miss God's blessing because we don't do this. Look what it says, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. He's recognizing, God, you're my protector. You're the one who's got my back. You're the one that defends me from all of these attacks. I don't have to worry about this. Look what he says here. You are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head up. David had lost everything. Many would think, that David's glory was diminished because he's no longer the king. Many would think, David, you lost all your assets. See, so what we do, we, we brag about our accomplishments, our assets, our titles, things like that. But David knew his glory was in the Lord. And the people of God take their glory in the Lord. God, you're my protector. You are my glory. You're the one who lifts up my head have you ever done that with a small child that's upset and you just reach down and you touch their chin and you make them look up at you and you say, hey, it's gonna be all right. And if you're me, you tell them, would you like some ice cream? Because <laughs> I'm a papa. And we have a saying in our house, what does Nana say? David will go, no, no. <laughs> I say, what does Papa say? Yeah, yes. No, no. <laughs> Psalm 121, David said, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And when I turn my attention to the Lord, all of a sudden everything gets better. He says this in verse four, I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. I love, I love what David does. He redirects his attention. David is going up the Mount of Olives and he looks back at the throne. He looks back at the, at the city of David and Absalom's on the throne. David's been deposed and he looks at that city that he loves so much and he thinks, it looks like Absalom's in control. It looks like everything's going wrong. But God, I know you are still on the throne. God is able. God is able, amen? And David is fleeing up the Mount of Olives, but God is his encourager. And this is where we, we find the third thing that David did. He found his strength in the Lord. He found his strength in the Lord. And oftentimes in this situation, we look here in verse five with me, he said this, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. Now, anybody here ever have problems sleeping? Right, when your mind's just going on and on. This is the worst day of David's life. Okay, but somehow after he goes to the Lord in prayer, he's got a release. He lets it go. He's not carrying that burden anymore. And what does he do? He goes to sleep. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. Now imagine this. There were thousands of people searching for David. He should have in his sleep, he was at his most vulnerable point. 
It was very likely what would have been normal as that David would have been killed in his sleep. Many on that day would have said, David will never live to see another day. And yet he says, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. And this is the beautiful thing. What we know is this. We know that one of the advisors, Ahithophel, whose words were like the words for an oracle, went and sided with Absalom. And David, David sent in Hushai the Archite. Don't you love these Bible names? Hushai the Archite. Ahithophel, Absalom asked him, what should we do? It's on the day, the day of the insurrection. Ahithophel says, take 12,000 men and go right now while David is tired, while he's exhausted. Find him. He's going to be full of fear. And we will, the 12,000 men, we will only strike one person. We'll kill David. And then the kingdom will we be united. But Absalom called in a second counselor, Hushai. He said, Hushai, what do you think we should do? Ahithophel says this, Hushai was the friend of King David. And Hushai said to Absalom, Absalom, the timing of what Ahithophel says is not good because David, you know that he has mighty men and that they are enraged right now. And they will be like a bear separated from her cubs in the field. If you go right now, wait and call the people of Israel together. And Absalom said, the counsel of Hushai is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. And what happened is this. While David brought his problem to the Lord, God was working on the inside. He had an inside man inside in the throne room speaking to the king. And while David turned his problem over to the Lord and was able to sleep and be restored, God was fixing his problem. Because look what happens. Aren't you thankful that God's always working on the inside? Amen? Oh, what a beautiful Beautiful story, and look how he wakes up. Verse six, he wakes up from this sleep and he says, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me all around. I love this, and this is the power. I used to sing this as a kid. There's a song to this. And if you have a way of finding songs that are direct scripture that you can teach your kids, it's so powerful in their life. It'll put the word of God in their life. I will not be afraid of 10,000 people. Should one man be afraid of 10,000 people? <laughs> yeah, you bet. Okay. Should one man with God Almighty on his side be afraid of 10,000 people? No. See, David knew. It doesn't matter who all is on Absalom's side. I am the man of God. I have God Almighty on my side. And greater is he who is in me. Amen. That's it. And David wakes up. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people. And he does his best Superman flex. Right? He does a little Neo from the Matrix. I'm ready to take him on. And look what he says here in verse seven. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. Who do you think David thinks the battle belongs to? God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Man, I want you to know, have you ever had a dog sneak up on you? Right. That's right on you. You're, oh, and you're just, you're afraid, right? You're afraid, man, what, what am I gonna do? But then you realize this dog has no teeth. <laughs> Does your emotional state change? Oh yeah, he's a gummy dog. It's a new candy coming to a store near you. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. And when the enemy comes like a lion seeking whom he may devour, you remember that God has struck him on the cheek and that lion has no teeth in the name of Jesus. Amen? You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. And look what he says here in verse eight. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Would you say that with me? Salvation. 
Would you yell it with me? Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This, this word salvation can be interpreted as victory. Victory belongs to the Lord. And if victory belongs to the Lord and I belong to Jesus, guess what is gonna come in my corner, man? Salvation belongs to the Lord. And then look at this last line in this verse. And to all your blessing is upon your people. David's concern here is not only about himself. David's concern is also about the people of Israel. And I want you to know something, that when you allow the Lord to fight your battles, he will fight your battles better than you ever could have, amen? He will bring answers not only for today, but for blessings and generations to come, amen? God is able, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Come on, say it with me. Salvation belongs, I want you to stand and say it with me. Salvation belongs, one more time. Salvation belongs to the Lord, your blessing. It's upon your people. <laughs> Hallelujah. How do I get that peace back in my life? I turn to the Lord. I put my problems on him. I turn my focus on him. I receive strength from the Lord. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, today I know there are people here that are fighting so many different types of battles. Some of them, Lord, today when they walked in here, they felt so much anxiety, so much stress from the week they've just gone through. Lord, we believe that you are the one who gives us a peace that passes all understanding. Right now, I want you to do this with me. I want you to just practice with your hands what we were talking about. When we're, we're not gonna spread it around. What are you gonna do with your problems? Come on. I want you to lift it up. Lift your hands to the Lord. Heavenly Father, right now, God, in this prayer of dedication, Lord, we lift up to you that which has caused us to lose sleep. We lift up to you that which has robbed us of our peace. Lord Jesus, we lay this at your feet and we say, salvation belongs to you, O Lord. You are the one that our help comes from. Lord, we invite you into this situation and we declare you are greater than this problem we're facing. And Lord, we direct our attention to you. You are the creator of this universe. You are the savior of our soul. You have been faithful to generations and God, as you have been faithful so far, we know that you will see us through. So Lord, we lift up our voice now. Right now, I want you to begin speaking audibly the praises of the Lord. Would you just begin to speak? Jesus, I praise you. Jesus, I lift you up. Lord, we give you glory and honor and praise. Oh, come on, let's worship the Lord. Thank you for joining us today, Canyon Hills. We hope the Holy Spirit spoke to you through this message. Our prayer is that your heart was touched and forever changed. God's word is true and life-changing. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to stay up to date on all the things happening here. That way you'll always be in the know when we post new messages, videos from Canyon Hills worship, and when we're live during Sunday and Wednesday services. If you're new to Canyon Hills, we'd love to learn more about you and how we can pray for you and serve you well. You can click the link in the video notes or text NEXT to 661-387-3131 for all the ways to connect at Canyon Hills. We hope you'll have a blessed day and we'll see you next time.